Hi everyone, welcome to Ramwick Presbyterian Church Online. My name is Kevin, I'm one of the ministers here at this church. Uh, and it's really great that you could join us online and you could connect with us in this way. We would love to connect with you. Um, if you would like to find out more about our church, just uh, head to our church website and uh, there's a little connect card that you can fill out. We'd love to get to know you and uh, connect with you. Uh, and we really hope that you enjoy this weekly message that has been pre-recorded for you. Reading is from Judges 8, 22 to the end of the chapter. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us out of the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. 
it was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, We'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each man threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels. Not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains that were on their camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshipping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites, and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land enjoyed peace for 40 years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their god and did not remember the Lord their god who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show kindness to the family of Jeroboam, Baal, that is Gideon, for all the good things he had done for them. Well, we're uh, in the book of Judges still, and today we're going to be looking at Judges chapters 6, 7, 8 and 9. It's a handful, but it's pretty much all about Gideon. And in fact, that's the way Gideon wants it, but more of that in a moment. A few years ago, two American judges deceitfully increased the number of juvenile uh, offenders sent to privately owned detention facilities rather than to state-run prisons. It was all because it was a matter of them being fraudulent. And in exchange for their fraud, the judges received money from those who owned these private jails. They could have sent them to state-run, but they sent them off to the private jails to make some money, to get a kickback, and assumed honest court system was made corrupt for private gain. What was meant to be a solution, that is, jails are meant to be part of the solution, became part of the problem. In Judges 6, chapter 6 to 9, we witness something similar, but first let's recap the last few chapters of Judges. God raised up judges, as it says in chapter 2, verse 16, to save God's people from their enemies and to experience peace. Under Judge, Judge Othniel, it was 40 years of peace. With Judge Ehud, it was 80 years of peace. Under Deborah, it was 40 years. But none of the judges removed their enemies or their enemies' gods which is not surprising because back in chapter 2 we read, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt, led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land and you will also break down their altars but you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? So I will not drive them out before you. They, these enemies, will become traps for you 
and their gods will become snares to you. God's judges might bring about peace for a time, but they would not solve Israel's problem of truly obeying God. And as you read through the judges, the situation gets worse. In fact, we see in Gideon a bigger problem than a better solution. Uh, turn with me to chapter 8, verses 27, and see how Gideon finishes up. He takes gold, he makes it into an ephod, which is a special kind of jacket. And as he places this jacket in his hometown, Israel worships it like an idol. And as predicted back in chapter 2, it becomes a snare to Gideon and his family. It's a tragic note, Gideon the judge leading Israel into idolatry. God's good solution becoming Israel's bad problem. But that's not how things began for Gideon. He starts as a humble hero by acknowledging he was the least likely person from the least likely clan that God could choose to take on the role of a judge. His ending contrasts so differently to his beginning, from being humble to holier than thou, from being childlike to being likened to a god. So the story begins in chapter 6 with Israel abandoning God and now facing the consequences. It's a different enemy. This time it's the Midianites. And the Israelites are hiding in the mountain caves with their backs to the wall. In verse 4, the Midianites ruin Israel's crops and their sheep, cattle and donkeys. And then in chapter 6, verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. It's strange that someone who's declared a mighty warrior by God is inside threshing wheat in a wine press. It's like it's his own man cave. But it becomes clear that this so-called mighty warrior, is angry with God. When in verse 13 we hear Gideon accusing God of abandoning Israel. Chapter 6, verse 13. But sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. In reply, in verse 14, the Lord says, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Gideon either wants to stay safe in his winery, in his man cave, or believes the job is too much for him. Because in verse 15, he again says, But Lord, how can I serve Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. But God has good news for him. Verse 16, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Still Gideon is reticent and replies, If now I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'll wait until you return. From verse 19 there in chapter 6, Gideon, he's making an offering to God, comes face to face with the angel of the Lord. He's frightened for his life, but is assured that he's safe. With the Lord telling him, verse 25, to tear down his father's false altars and to build a proper altar to God. 
and to take a bull from his father's herd and sacrifice it by burning the Asherah pole that his father and clan have been worshipping. Wow, this, this is serious. Burning the Asherah pole that belongs to your father? From verse 27, Gideon obeys God, but he does it at night because he's afraid of what his family and the men of the town would do, which becomes clear because verse 29, they want to kill Gideon for what he's done. But he's saved by his father's intervention. From verse 33, Israel's enemies, the Midianites, the Amalekites and other tribes, the same tribes who gave Israel such a hard time when they were travelling between Egypt and the land promised by God, well, they've joined forces to attack Israel. So verse 40, uh, 34, the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet summoning the Abizrites to follow him there where his clan belongs. And again, Gideon, he's cautious. He needs reassurance that God is with them. He must have left his warrior trait that God gave him in the wine press in his man cave. So verse 36, Gideon says to God, if you'll save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I'll place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I'll know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And note that he's already said that God's promised to do it. Why the fleece? So what happens? Gideon gets up the next day, squeezes the dew from the fleece. For a half-confident person, well, that would have been enough, but not for Gideon. Verse 39, he says to God, don't be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered by the fleece, make it covered with dew. And the next day, the fleece is dry while the ground below is covered with dew. And to reassure Gideon, God allows Gideon to overhear the Midianites talking about the result of a dream that they've had. Chapter 7, verse 14 now, where a Midianite says, this dream can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites, us, he's given us, and the whole camp into his hands. It's a dream gift from God with God winning the victory in an unusual way. In chapter 7, verse 2, we read that Gideon's pulled together an army of 32,000. But the Lord says to him, you've got too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. And God's reason for less men is, and I quote, it's in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. You need to remember that. Is there going to become a time when Israel will boast that they did it and not God? So the army is reduced to 10,000, but it's still too many. So God puts the men through a really weird water drinking uh, test, comparing those who lap the water up from their hands and those who kneel down to drink straight from the water's edge. And with 300 men lapping with their mouths, God has the army at the size he wants, to fight 120,000 Midianites. And everyone will know it's God who saves Israel with only 300 men. So as the tribe of Ephraim gets upset because they weren't invited to fight, well, Gideon, he takes a diplomatic approach. But note, while happy not to take the credit for himself, he doesn't give God the credit by saying God only needed 300 soldiers. Instead, look at chapter 8, verse 2. Gideon says to Ephraim, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings, that's what's left over after the, the harvest, of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abizia? That's Gideon's clan leader. God gave you, Oreb and Zeb and the Midianite leaders, gave them to you, because that's Ephraim's gleanings. You've got, you've got the good things. 
What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Gideon's a shrewd leader, but he leaves God out of his response. And at this point, Gideon has something of a brain snap. Thinking his power is of his own making, he decides to use it. So he starts his own private war. In, it begins in uh, verse 4 of chapter 8. At first, it doesn't look bad. But as you read through the chapter, that is chapter 8, you start to realize things have changed. For a start, not once does Gideon talk to God. From all those reassuring earlier chats with God to now nothing. Gideon doesn't want reassurance anymore. He believes he doesn't need God's help. He's no longer the humble person relying on God. He's now ruthless and cruel. When the people in the town of Succoth won't help him capture Zebar and Zalmunna, he says, this is in verse 7 of chapter 8, well, just for that, I'll tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. And it's something similar at Peniel, another town. When I return in triumph, I'll tear down this tower. I'll be back, says Gideon. Peniel and Succoth, you towns, you will pay for not helping me. What a contrast with the way he treated the people from Ephraim, diplomatic. And now he's brash, harsh, and arrogant. Gideon's humility and dependence on God, they've gone. It's not that he's less successful. He still manages to defeat an army of 15,000 with 300 tired men. It's just that God's out of the picture. It's all about Gideon, nothing about God. And the result is disastrous. The people forget the first great victory when Gideon was dependent on God. All they remember is his second victory with his private army seemingly made without God's help. And look what the Israelites say to Gideon, verse 22. Rule over us, you, your son and your grandson. Be a dynasty because you, you, have saved us out of the hand of Midian. Here they are, giving credit to Gideon instead of God. Sure, Gideon attempts a feeble protest in verse 23 about God being, a, being the real ruler and he not being a king. But in verse 24, he acts just like a king, getting everyone to pay him tribute. In verse 30, he has 70 sons with many wives. That's what kings did. And in verse 31, and this is where you can see his true attitude, the son he had to his concubine, he names him Abimelech, which means son of a king. You see, underneath his pious words, Gideon just wants to be king, living like a king, even if not accepting the title. And he goes further, setting up that ephod we read about at the start, an idol for the people to worship, leading them away from God. Gideon has so much godly potential, which is never fulfilled. He uses his power for his own agenda, not giving God the credit. And instead of leading the people to serve their real king, Gideon takes God's place and leads the people to serve him and his idol. It's a tragic end. The man who should have been a solution becomes part of Israel's problem, as Israel is still trapped in sin and idolatry. The name Jerubbabel given to Gideon back in chapter 6, verse 32, has acquired an ironic twist. You see, back in chapter 6, verse 32, we read, 
because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Zerubbabel, meaning let Baal contend with him. Well, the irony is that for his own purposes, Baal has indeed contended with Gideon. Through Gideon, Baal has turned God's people away from God, which leaves a tragic memory of Gideon. And there it is in verse 33. No sooner, in chapter 8 this is, no sooner had Gideon died, then the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up a Baal Bereth as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Zerubbabel, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. You see, God is forgotten. Gideon is forgotten. And proof of that is in chapter 9. When the son he had from a concubine, Abimelech, seeks to murder all of his 70 half-brothers that were mentioned earlier, removing all memory of Gideon, with only one escaping. The rest of the chapter, that is 9, chapter 9, details the internal fighting which began under Gideon and reaches new heights under Abimelech. Gideon was the first judge to turn the sword against his own people. And the civil war that erupts under Abimelech is a precursor to things to come. What is said back in chapter 8, verse 28, and I quote, that the land enjoyed rest and peace is never said again in the book of Judges. No rest, no peace, it's never mentioned again. Under Abimelech's three-year reign, Israel is in chaos. And just as he murdered his half-brothers on a stone in their father's hometown, he himself will be killed with a stone in the city of Thebes. Dropped by a woman, chapter 9, verse 50, from a tower filled with frightened people. Verse 52 says, Abimelech went to the tower and he stormed the tower. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire and to burn all the people inside alive, a woman dropped a millstone on his head and cracked his skull. It's the end of another power-hungry judge. And Israel is still in the grip of sin. You see, what Israel needed, what everyone needs, is a saviour who won't grasp power for himself, who won't take advantage of his position, who will humbly serve God right to the end, a saviour who solves the problem of us. It's the kind of saviour we read about in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 6. Jesus Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The exact opposite of Gideon and Abimelech. Not grasping for power, not accepting it when it was offered to him in the desert by Satan. Satan, the father of all Baals. Jesus, who is God, becoming human, becoming a servant, dying on a cross, a saviour who humbly trusts God to the end, who saves us from our enemies, even ourselves, and brings us back to God. In Philippians, Paul says our attitude should be the same as Jesus' attitude, humble, 
doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, putting others before ourself. A lot like Gideon in the start. Nothing like him at the end of his life. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knows he will be crucified on a Roman cross. He knows that this is God's agenda. And what does he say? Well, in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my agenda, but yours, right to the end. Jesus' death is our triumph. So the whole world needs to decide what response it's making to Jesus. Are we going to serve him with a childlike trust, depending on him for forgiveness, seeking to follow him and God's plan to fill his eternal kingdom with people who love him? That's the kind of followers God wants. But it can be so easy to have your own agenda. And like Gideon, it seems to coincide or follow after a difficult time that God has got us through. A rough ride followed by a more stable time. And instead of giving God thanks and praising him and enjoying him and making our thoughts about him public by encouraging others also to seek after God, be they Christian or non-Christian, we start to ignore God and the memory of his goodness fades away. This is what happened at the time of the judges and it seems it's still happening now, today. So we need to plead with God for forgiveness and give our loyalty and love to him. Rather than pursuing our agendas with our list of demands on how we'll follow God if he comes through for us. For example, like, I'll follow you as long as it helps my career agenda. I'll follow you as long as it helps me to be liked or popular or powerful. I'll follow you as long as it helps my financial plan for my life agenda. I'll follow you as long as it helps my family to be free from any bad times or suffering agenda. Agendas that have long forgotten the cross of Christ and what that cross achieved. So if you're harboring a personal agenda in your relationship with God, get rid of it. Gideon has shown us Personal agendas lead to disaster. Following God based on Jesus' victory, being childlike and obedient and humbly trusting God is the only way to live our life for Jesus. It's to be our only agenda. I'll pray. Our Father and our God, please help us to cast aside all of our personal agendas. Please forgive us for having such personal agendas. And through your Holy Spirit, may we seek your agenda in being obedient to you, in giving our lives to you because of what Jesus has done. Please help us to live our life for you and for that to be our one and only agenda. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.